Good day, everyone. Thank you in for joining in today. My name is Kas Pau, and together with my colleague Andrea Di Benedetto, I'm going to present our work for the Pedestrian and Evacuation Dynamics Conference. The topic of uh, this talk is about graph based real time monitoring of physical distancing and estimation of secondary infection probabilities. And this work is a continuation of our previous work, which we published last year in PLOS One. It is believed that physical distancing is one of the most effective ways to prevent the spreading of the COVID-19 virus. And the first question that pops to mind is, do people adhere to physical distancing? The second question is, what if a random person is infected? Is, how likely is he infecting other pedestrians? And with the recent emergence of uh, highly accurate pedestrian tracking sensors, like the one you can see on the right, we can try to find answers to both questions. The High statistic data sets we can generate with these sensors. So you can see now on the left where the red dots represent pedestrians. We can check all the mutual distances between people in a certain facility, and we can state what if a random person is infected, how likely is, a, is he infecting others? So we can see the random blue dot. Uh, we can see what the distance to other pedestrians and how we interact with other pedestrians in order to find. Uh, how likely he is infecting other pedestrians. There are two challenges connected to these questions. The first challenge is connected to the complexity of the task, because we want to compute all the distances and times between end pedestrians in our facility. We want to do this in real time and with only one forward pass. So we don't want to roll back time in order to determine the distance and time contact pattern. And computing all these mutual distances scales as n squared times t, where n is the number of pedestrians and t is the time. The second challenge is based on the fact that not everyone is mandatory um, to distance from one another. What I mean by this is that families don't necessarily need to social distance. So we need a way to detect family groups in our data set uh, automatically and unsupervised without infringing any privacy. So we want to do this solely based on the distance and time contact pattern between all the pedestrians. In order to deal with this challenging complexity, we propose to use a graph-based pedestrian interaction network. In this network, we store the pedestrians uh, on the nodes, and we store the interactions between pedestrians on the edges. And to keep this tractable, we propose to only make an edge if the distance is lower than a certain threshold. In our case, we use 2.5 meters. The distance statistics on these edges is also quantized. And in our case, we used five distance bins to store the interaction. So if we look in, at the animation on the right, we can see that the pedestrians come closer when they're closer than a certain threshold, 2.5 meters. We start filling the first bin. And when the movie continues, we fill also the other bins based on the direct interaction the mutual distance between the two pedestrians. I want to tackle the second challenge based on the interaction pattern between the pedestrians. And if we take a look at the interaction pattern between two pedestrians like this, we can see that in this case, the two pedestrians stayed for a prolonged time closer than one meter to one another. And especially in the COVID-19 time, this is very unlikely for pedestrians who do not belong to the same family group. So if we take a look at the animation that belongs to this interaction pattern, we can see that the two pedestrians entered the facility together, waited next to each other, and continued their journey also together. So based on this contact pattern, we can say that these pedestrians stay for a prolonged time together, and that based on that contact pattern, they are most likely belonging to the same family group. So we aim to detect family groups based on the fact that they stayed uh, at, the close, at the short mutual distance for the majority of their trajectory. In order to verify that this way of detecting family groups is working, we want to like, uh, take a look at the radial distribution function, where we look at the probability to find a mutual distance r between two pedestrians. And we want to compare this radial distribution function from our data with the radial distribution function of a randomly distributed crowd. And first, let's take a look at uh, the radial distribution function with on the x-axis r, on the y-axis the probability to find this distance r of our real-life data set. Now, 
if we look at a random distribution of pedestrians, we would expect that the probability to find a pedestrian scales in the same way as the way this circumference r is increasing. And when r is lower than the platform width, this circumference is linearly increasing as r is increasing. So we would expect uh, at the distance r lower than the platform width uh, linear growth. However, when the mutual distance r becomes larger than the platform width, we see that the location on the circumference of the circle where we can find a pedestrian, this green bit, is only remaining constant. So also the probability to find a pedestrian at this location should remain constant. Now if we take a look at the difference between the radial distribution function of a randomly distributed crowd compared to the radial distribution function of our real data, we can see that it's only deviating here between zero and one meter. And we expect that this is uh, caused by the family contributions. So, and that's because only families stay closer than this one meter distance uh, to one another. So we would expect that if we prune our data set with our algorithm for family contributions, uh, this uh, data set adheres better to the uh, radial distribution function, which we would expect from a randomly distributed crowd. And indeed, the red crosses show us how this pruned data set would look like, and it adheres completely to both uh, to the, the randomly distributed crowd. And now I would like to give the word to Andrea for the next part of this talk. Thank you, Cass. Now we can start our discussion about the estimation of secondary infection probability. Basically, we want to answer the question, if a random person is infected in our network, what is the probability to have another one infected at the end of the time window in which this network is built? In order to solve this issue, we start from the network introduced by Cass and we look at the scenario in which one of the pedestrians is infected. Indeed, we will have a random individual that joins the graph, that in this case is the node A. He will be surrounded by susceptible individuals, meaning that they will have the possibility to get the disease. In this case, they are represented in green. A crucial point in our analysis is that we expect to see the transmission only to the first neighbors of the infected pedestrian. For example, in this case, the pedestrian A will have a probability to infection only to B, C, D or E, the first neighbors, and the probability to have an infection from A to G or from A to F will be zero. Furthermore, since the time window considered in constructing this contact graph was much smaller than the estimated uh, incubation time of COVID-19, we expect to observe only one transmission of the disease. And this will happen only to the nearest neighbors of the infected, that in this case is A. Then we can focus our attention to the nearest neighbors of A and give an estimate of, on what is the probability to have an infection from A to B or C or D or E. This will be given by 1 minus the probability that no transmission will happen. And by generalizing this to a neighborhood of N individuals, we can estimate the probability of secondary infection. This, of course, is highly depending on the individual probability of infection. That will be depending on the information stored in the edges, like the distance at which the contact was and the contact time. The problem is that our dataset is a much larger and complex mathematical object, and we don't know who will be the initial infected. Because of this, we can perform a mean field approach by evaluating the probability of having a secondary infection given one at random infected in the graph. This will be given by the probability of having, for example, A infected multiplied to the probability that given A infected, we will have another infected, for example, B, in its nearest neighbors. The first value will be given simply by 1 divided by the total number of elements in the graph. This is the case because we are considering that initially everyone will have the same probability to be infected. 
the second probability, on the other hand, will be evaluated analogously as we did in the previous slides, where we considered only the nearest neighbors of the node A infected. The point now is to define how actually the virus and the, his transmission depends on the information stored in the edges, distance and contact time. This is arbitrary, we can choose any model. In our case, we considered a model from the literature based on the exchange, exchange of saliva between individuals. On the right, we can see a plot where we have the probability of infection versus contact time for different distances. Putting everything together, we can get an estimate on the average probability to have a secondary infection. In this plot, we have our result where the x-axis represents time in chronological order, from the end of April to the end of June 2020, and each point represents a day. On the y-axis, we have the average daily probability of having an infection per graph. This corresponds, basically, to the average daily probability of having a secondary infection in the time window in which a train approaches the platform of Utrecht Central Station in the Netherlands. We obtain a result of a 4% of probability to have a secondary infection. Of course, this is the case because it was a scenario where no one was vaccinated. So we performed our calculation starting from a huge and detailed dataset. But is there a way to perform a sort of approximation and do the same starting only from average properties of the system? Well, yes. Indeed, by observing the distribution of edges per node, meaning the distribution of interactions per pedestrian, we can do an estimate of the, sec the probability of secondary infection by starting only from the average number of interactions per node, also called mean degree, and its standard deviation. Indeed, by performing a simple calculation, we obtain an estimate of the same probability as before, with quite convincing results. In red, on the right plot, we, we have the probability estimated by considering the entire mathematical object. In green, the probability calculated only starting from average properties, that are the mean degree and its standard deviation. To conclude, we can say that we developed an efficient framework to observe pedestrian dynamics. This gives us the possibility to perform analysis on physical distancing and contagion probability. Starting from this, we then applied a mean field approach and estimated a probability, an average daily probability, of around 4% that, on the time window considered, we will have a secondary infection. Finally, we also show that this result can be achieved by approximating the entire dataset into a set of two variables, the mean degree of the graph and its standard deviation. Thank you for your attention and we will be very happy to receive and answer your questions. Thank you. Goodbye.